Hi, welcome and thank you for joining our second Synergy webinar series where we aim to give you the most complete picture for material characterization using multiple complementary techniques. So today we'll be looking at pharma applications using Raman spectroscopy and laser diffraction. There will be more to come, so make sure you join our newsletter or simply connect with us on LinkedIn. My name is Julie Chen Nguyen, and I'll be facilitating today, along with your speakers, um, Dr. Una Lee, um, our Raman application scientist, and Dr. Jeff Bodicom, our product line manager from the Particle Characterization Group. So Jeff earned his PhD in material science and engineering from Rutgers University, whereas Una received her PhD in physical chemistry from Syracuse University. And Jeff, whenever you're ready, please go ahead and share your screen. Great. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Julie kind of introduced everything. Uh, so Una and I are going to talk today about size, chemistry, more, and uh, both Raman and laser diffraction analysis for pharmaceutical particles. And, and, and she and I have worked together on various things over the past decade or so, and it's always been entertaining to combine the te two techniques or look, use these two points of view to get at better answers to customer problems. Yeah. So uh, as Julie mentioned, we have a number of products for pharmaceuticals and biopharmaceuticals, and we'll cover them both in this series as well as uh, webinars outside the series, including SPRI, uh, fluorescence, which is another chemical ID technique, Raman, you'll hear about shortly, uh, X-ray fluorescence uh, for elemental analysis, and then particle characterization tools. And if you look at the pharmaceutical process, you're really going from drug discovery through uh, preclinical studies, clinical studies, submission, and launch. And as you get towards the end of this pro, so in the beginning and uh, towards the end of the process, you're going to start looking at your analytical techniques again. Uh, you know, at your submission, you certainly are, will need to talk intelligently about your uh, drug delivery system and formulation and how you'll measure things. So if you look at uh, peroral or topical formulations, you want to verify your API form, concentration, and distribution. Uh, you start looking at particle size distribution depending on, on your drug solubility, as well as questions of dose uniformity for uh, solid dosage forms. Uh, for inhalation and uh, parental dosages, you're looking at particle counts. Again, you're back to size, shape, and particle chemistry. And you also are start thinking about these questions of scale up and manufacturing. Um, so as you ask these questions, I kind of mentioned, you're gonna start looking for answers and ways to monitor and control things, you'll look at particle characterization for questions ranging from uh, dissolution and solubility to uh, suspension stability to filterability. Uh, you'll look at things at Raman microscopy as you start worrying about things like, do you have the right materials uh, or the, uh, in, in your drug? Do you have the right distribution of sizes in a mixture and so on? as well as do you have the right form, polymorph, et cetera. At launch and as you go into manufacturing, uh, you're gonna be well into the world of uh, quality control and quality analysis where you're screening raw materials, uh, you're testing why things might fail, whether it's a batch or, uh, a, or part of your process, you're checking content uniformity, you're doing root cause analysis. You're also continuing surveillance for uh, drug interactions or any excipient effects, as well as count, looking at the market at counterfeit drugs and patent infringement to kind of defend your IP, uh, both your name as a manufacturer in the case of counterfeits, as well as your, your patents uh, that really the value in the drug manufacturer, as well as support any research and investigation by regulatory entities. So when the FDA has a question, you often turn to these tools for answers. And you have kind of continuous verification. Uh, particle characterization, you might continuously check that to make you're sure that the emulsions have the right droplet sizes. Or if you're doing a vaccine uh, based on growing a virus, then you'll, you might use nanoparticle tracking analysis to get titers or as a substitute for uh, measuring virus titers. 
on and off. Now, another application is if you're using raw microscopy, you can start to answer and reassure yourself, yourself about polymorph characterization. Are you getting the right forms of various materials? Uh, so this is mannitol forms in different powder blends, and you'll get slightly different uh, polymorphs. So this talk is really in two parts. Uh, I'm going to start talking about particle characterization and then I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Lee, who will continue talking about raw microanalysis and re really from the point of view of particles and how you can extend that. Uh, although she has many other tricks in her tool bag if you have other questions. In particle characterization, uh, Haribo offers a number of techniques. I show here laser diffraction, uh, dynamic light scattering for smaller particle sizes, and image analysis. Uh, for looking at larger particles and looking at particle shape. We also offer nanoparticle tracking analysis with a, a multi-laser system. It lets me get at questions of size distribution as well as nanoparticle concentration. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about laser diffraction, give you a brief overview of, of the technique in general a few comments about our flagship instrument, the LA960, and a couple of simple examples of what you can do with the technique. Some quick perspective, and this, this is a performance graph, uh, kind of gets you oriented. I have diameter of the particle in microns on the bottom, and my y-axis is really the resolution of mixtures of particle components. And you know, this ranges from kind of nanometers up to millimeters in size. And laser diffraction sits kind of in the middle, higher resolution than dynamic light scattering. Uh, and your particle size range goes from tens of nanometers up to several millimeters. And of course, this gets applied in all sorts of fields, not just pharmaceuticals, which is helpful because you can draw lessons from one field to apply to another. So laser diffraction looks at scatter light as a function of angle uh, to convert into a particle size distribution. And so uh, you have the figure on the right with the laser hits the sample and you have detectors at a number of different angles. And the screens on the bottom show kind of two different samples. As you move from the center out, you'll see scattering as rings or peaks. And, and it's interpreting these rings that gives us the size distribution. Advantages, it's very fast. You can get a measurement in just a minute or so. It's very repeatable, and you can use it for powders and dry powders and liquid suspensions, uh, including emulsions. And so it's really one of the most common particle sizing techniques out there, because it also covers a wide range. I didn't mention that in the slide, but it does cover kind of a very wide range of uh, sizes. A zoomed in picture of laser diffraction optics and our LA960. I guess the one difference here compared to what I discussed already is that you'll see there are actually two different light sources, a red and a blue. And it's really these two wavelengths that lets us get down to the smaller particle sizes because the shorter wavelength on the blue lets me go down to smaller sizes. If, and the wide number of detectors gets me the size range. And that includes a forward angle ring detector for the very small forward angles it gets me to larger particles. So laser diffraction really counts on path length difference. Um, you have some incoming light and it hits the particle and it's scattered. And so you'll have waves of light coming off in all different directions. And if I look straight down, these two waves uh, interfere constructively. I'm sorry, destructively. And so my resulting intensity is quite low. And if I look off to the side, you'll see that the interference is constructive and my interference is quite high. So I might have a peak in my scattering at 45 degrees from this particular particle and a valley at 90 degrees. So anyway, that's the physical phenomena behind it. The results we return are really the size of a particle I'm sorry, the size of a sphere that scatters like your particle. And that's proven to be quite a reliable measure for many industries, and including pharmaceutical, of course. 
so that was a quick comment on how we do it. And to tell you the truth, with the math, you can just turn it all over to the software, and away you go. Uh, next question that's going to come up, and certainly for practical analyses, comes up a fair amount. How much material do you need? Uh, this is less important when you're at the end stages of manufacturing, where you might have a lot of sample, and more important at the early stage of development where samples are quite precious. Uh, so laser fraction, we have a number of options. I'm sorry, we have a number of options for sample handling. In the middle, you'll see a fraction cell, which is more or less a, a, a cuvette uh, with volumes ranging from about 5 ml to I think 15 ml is our largest. Uh, that you can use for smaller size samples and use only a tiny amount of material. We then have kind of a medium size, a larger units, and then we have uh, going up to requiring about 300 ml of suspension. And so the, there are different advantages to all of them. And as we talk about your measurements, we certainly will guide you as to which makes the most sense. But for biopolymer, and the amount we require depends on the sampling system and the size of your particles and the width of your size distribution. So the biopolymer here, we need about one and a half, less than one and a half milligrams at 100, 100 microns or so. A colloidal silica, I need much more material, 132 milligrams. It's quite small at 35 nanometers. And I think this was run on one of the larger sample handlers. And then magnesium stearate, uh, another about 10 micron excipient, uh, need about 0 0.165 milligrams for, to run that. And so the, the quantity required really depends on how you handle the sample and how large it is. Okay, I claim the instruments are repeatable. Um, and so I want to make a quick comment on instrument to instrument variation. We have done a number of studies across laboratories. We have customers with instruments at multiple sites. And they like, they like it when all their factories report the same numbers for the same material. It gets them great, greater global quality, and we can support that. So here's one study that we could release some of the data at least. Two different formulations. Uh, the first one has a mean diameter of 155 nanometers, and standard deviation is 0 0.8, and coefficient of variation of 0.5%. This is four different instruments separated across labs, and so not only is there nice repeatability in the analyzers, it also is in the methods. You look at the 50, 152 nanometers, and a coefficient variation of 0.6%. So that's quite nice. Uh, second formulation, uh, mean size, about 193 nanometers. Coefficient variation across these labs, 0.8%. And D50 is also somewhat larger, 187 and coefficient variation is 0.3%. And, and so one of the values of laser diffraction uh, and, and the LA960 is that you can count on having the same answer at multiple sites, which lets you spread out your manufacturing as you scale up. Next, and uh, I'm gonna start easing my way into some practical examples uh, and the repeatability. So this is magnesium stearate. I didn't mention it in the previous slides, but laser diffraction can be used with dry powders as well as liquid suspensions and emulsions. So the mag rate run four repeats as a dry powder, and the median size in microns is about eight, oh, sorry, eight, 8.2 microns, a standard deviation of 0 0.024 micron, a coefficient of variation is 0.3%. And you can see the size distribution graph to the right, and that you can see the distributions overlay quite nicely. Now this really rests on two things. Uh, in the dry powder measurement, we run the sample and then we have to take a second fresh batch of sample and run it for the second time. So not only is the analyzer repeatable, but our splitting and consistency in sampling is repeatable. And we can help guide you through that, kind of getting the best performance out of your instrument during the installation process. Okay, moving on to another example, this is a nano emulsion uh, vaccine adjuvant. And if you consider, uh, sorry, yeah, if you think, if you consider filtration sterilization, you can plot your flux 
uh, through a filter as a function of mean particle size. So you want a 200 nanometer filter. And it turns out that you can just push a whole bunch more material through the filter at 120 nanometers compared to 170 nanometers. And so this is a downstream process. And if you can make sure that your particle size in the beginning is small, you get more efficiency further down in the process. And so in this case, it was monitored with our by laser diffraction, even though the size range could also be uh, analyzed with dynamic light scattering. I'll mention why in the next slide. And we also offer DLS when it's more appropriate. So it's kind of easy to switch back and forth about whichever fits best. A squalane uh, run through a microfluidizer and the unprocessed material had about was about 10 microns, the bulk of the materials. And then in the powder blue, you sent the first pass. Uh, you can start to see the peak at 100 odd nanometers. And then we'll jump to the green at the, sorry, the green's a first pass at a different formulation. And the red is with three passes. If you look real closely at the 10 micron, you can still see a little bit of material left over even after uh, three passes for the green formulation at 7250. Uh, so, the advantage of the 960 or is that you're able to look at your entire process from your starting material at 10 microns, which is certainly too large for comfortable dynamic light scattering, all the way down to about 100 nanometers. And you'll have nice consistent results from start to finish. And you only need one analyzer. Won't break my heart if you, someone purchases two, but often not how the world works. Okay, another example, this is polylactide nanoparticles for drug delivery. And the good material, again, is down in the 100 nanometer range. I, I zoomed in the graph and you can find for the bad material that we had a few fairly small fraction by volume of 10 micron and 20, 30, 40, 50 micron material. And so, and, and, and the customer was really able to see a performance difference between these two drug delivery particles. So we, we ran the analyses, and if you look at D10, D50, D90, they're very, very much the same. And you have really want to look at the volume mean sizes as your uh, quality attribute for this particular material, because that's most sensitive to this small calculation-wise to this small number of larger particles. Because remember, all these numbers come from the same underlying measured distribution. And you want to pick the one that will most clearly tell you what's happening that's important to you. OK, kind of moving later in the manufacturing process, and almost right to the end, really, if you look at children's Tylenol, um, and we have kind of two ways of getting at it. There's chewable bubble gum flavor, 160 mg of acetaminophen in each tablet with various uh, inactive ingredients, including our friend Mag Stereate that I mentioned earlier, down towards the bottom. And then we have the suspension grape flavor, acetaminophen 160 mg in every five mil, and another list of inactive ingredients. I don't have examples of those in the previous measurements, uh, although we've run a few of those in our lab, I recognize them. And we run laser diffraction, and you can see the red and the green. Uh, so left axis is volume, bottom axis is particle diameter. See the red and the green is a chewable bubble gum flavor. Um, and you have about 34, uh, 30 odd micron peak, as well as a second peak at 300 and call it 380 micron between the two. And in the black, I have the grape flavor suspension where we see smaller droplets at eight microns and larger ones at two, 220 microns. And so you're getting quite different analysis results. Now, one thing is that we're measuring all the particles in the sample, not necessarily just the API. Uh, and, and as you saw, these are fairly complicated mixtures. That's kind of a segue into another way of looking at 
mixtures of particles and uh, Dr. Lee. Luna? <laughs> yep. Thank you, Jeff. So from this point on, we are going to talk about uh, Raman microscopy. Raman microscopy is a combined instrument of Raman and optical microscopy. And using optical microscopy, you can perform static image analysis for particle characterization. And these are sample preparation methods, popular ones for static image analysis. And once you have particle characterizations using the static image where you get counts, size, shape, their distribution, you also get location of those particles. So you can send your uh, instrument to each particle location to automatically acquire Raman spectra for chemical identification. So how does Raman works? And <laughs> this is a very simplified uh, version of it. So you excite your sample with a laser. So laser is a single wavelength, right? And when you get uh, Raman scattering uh, from diff at different wavelengths, that's why it's uh, inelastic light scattering. And this Raman scattering, Raman peaks, Raman spectrum, they correspond to molecular structure or crystal structure vibrations. So when you study Raman spectrum, you can you learn what are the molecular structures or crystal phases, which leads to Raman identification. But nowadays, uh, you do Raman identification by typically search the Raman, uh, Raman libraries of reference spectra. Raman microscopy is non-invasive, non-destructive analytical technique, and requires virtually no sample preparation. So Explora, um, the data I will show in this presentations are acquired with Explora Confocal Raman Microscope. It is one of uh, Raman, Confocal Raman Microscope's series at Horiba. It is fully automated with three lasers, four gratings, and scanning stage, automated motorized stage. And I'm happy to show you our latest addition to uh, Raman series. It's called Soleil, and it has just become available. Now, LabSpec 6 is uh, Raman software. It is a complete package. So it controls the instrument, acquires the data, process the data, it can do multiple analysis, um, it can do extended focus, it can do um, the peak feeding and all of those. And these icons you see on this slide represents popular and specialized applications. And we are going to, uh, the main focus of this presentation is particle finder uh, marked with a, a rectangle <laughs> there. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, and it is dedicated to particle characterization or what we call particle correlated Raman spectroscopy. It is dedicated to PCRS application. So how Ra uh, Particle Finder performs PCRS, it takes optical image first and detects you can see the particle has a different contrast from the background, yes? So it can detect particles automatically and do the particle morphology analysis, its locations, its counts, its sizes, ellipse, uh, ellipse ratios, circularity. And then it records Raman spectra because it has the locations. It records Raman spectra from individual particles. And you have option to re, uh, record a map of a particle as well. And then you analyze the Raman spectra. Um, you can use a multivariate analysis or you, uh, and or you can uh, search a reference Raman libraries for reference Raman spectra for identification. And then 
you get statistical analysis. So the size distribution of chemical ingredient A, uh, Ellis ratio distribution of chemical ingredient B, and et cetera. So here is an example. It is a nasal spray, and it was sprayed onto microscope slide and let it dry. And that was the end of the sample preparation. And I'm not sure how it shows on your screen, but um, APIs are colored in blue. Cellulose on experience is colored in red based on Raman spectra of in each particles. And the red dots you see, and I think it is uh, better visible, they are lo precise location where you get Raman spectrum. And as you can see, each particle has a red dot on top of it. So this is the uh, tip, this is the results you can get. On the left, so you are comparing brand, nasal spray brand A and brand B. On the left uh, are particle, distrib particle size distribution uh, um, using area equivalent diameter uh, of API. And when you compare A brand A to brand B, brand B has narrower size distribution. On the right, is the similar results for cellulose. And you have you can see the same trend that brand B shows narrower size distribution than brand A. And you can you can uh, use the shape descriptors like ellipse ratio to, to similar analysis. On the left, the red excipients cellulose um, and blue API. You can see API are more circular than cellulose. On the right, it's the, uh, again, API is more, more uh, circular than cellulose. But when you compare brand A and B in cellulose ellipse ratio distribution, brand B is a little bit more elongated than brand A. So this is how you can get uh, you can get insight into each sample and between samples. Here is another example. We like <laughs> we like suspensions. So paracetamol is another name for acetaminophen, and it it is in suspension. So it is spread thinly onto a microscope slide and allowed to dry. And the particles you can see are uh, paracetamol, acetaminophen, and I can confirm that by recording Raman spectrum. The uh, black spectrum at the bottom, that's the representative spectrum from all those particles colored in green. And it, it shows perfect match to reference spectrum from Raman library of paracetamol. So yes, these are paracetamol particles. You can actually get data for individual particle, every individual, every particle in the um, in your sample, I mean in your uh, sample. So particle finders give you size, shape, location, uh, circularity, etc. And it gives you, of course, overall statistics such as size distribution, counts, T10, T50, T90. The advantage of have a, advantage of having access to individual uh, characteristics is that when you have outliers or suspect particles, you can go back and oh okay, you know it has different uh, it has different size. Uh, how about its ellipse ratio, for example? It has different um, circularity. How about its colors? You can look into further what is going on in your sample. And because you have the location, you can pick out that outlier, uh, that particle for additional analysis as well. And you can use a particle finder for Raman image too. So this is a um, vitamin C tablet and uh, we imaged with Raman, the entire tablet. And blue are ascorbic acid or vitamin C. And you can identify where everything is based on Raman spectra, yes? So red are citric acid, 
green are carotin and um, at the bottom middle uh, bottom middle you can see uh, a little bit of a yellow uh, area they are sorbitol and if you take the ascorbic acid image only the blue image in the previous uh, slide they you can see quote unquote particles so <clears throat> And you can uh, apply particle finder to this Raman image of ascorbic acid to get individual particle information, size distributions, counts, T10, T90, T50, etc. So you can perhaps use these results to check if there is any agglomeration happening during the tabletting, for example. Yeah. So there are more examples um, like this, you know, more tablets, more powders. And another one you can apply is um, ointment or here, tropical ointments or tropical creams. Again, they are spread thinly on a microscope slide and let it dry and you can identify particles, uh, characterize particles and require Raman spectra for chemical identification as well. To conclude, uh, this table show brief, uh, the simple and brief uh, comparison between LA960 and Explora or laser diffraction and Raman microscope. And as you can see, each has its own advantages. So when you analyze your sample with both technologies, you get a lot uh, better characterization, a lot uh, deeper analysis of your samples. With that, thank you for your attention and any questions? Well, thank you so much, Una, for the excellent webinar. I'm going to go ahead and turn on my webcam for the Q&A session. So a few questions that came in during your webinar, um, and we'll go through them one by one. I think the first question is for Jeff. When using laser diffraction for particle size determination, do you have to know certain parameters or physical characteristics about your sample? In general, the answer is yes, because when we look at how, uh, when we go to interpret the data, we have to look at how light travels through the particle. And so that really means we need to know, want to know the particle refractive index and as well as the absorption or amount of light absorbed uh, as the light travels through the particle. Uh, there, there are a couple extremes where that information becomes much less important. Certainly as you go to very, very large particle sizes, and there's a whole set of equations that treats that as a two-dimensional problem. And then when they're very small particle sizes and the light doesn't spend as much time in the particle, if you will, you can also kind of skate by that information. Uh, generally, I recommend, and I, I did this in another uh, calculations a while ago. I'm sure I can take them up if someone needs it. Uh, the uh, using a three-dimensional model that includes the optical properties of the particles is important uh, because you'll still you get better results using that than using the model, the two-dimensional model that doesn't ask for those parameters. So, uh, kind of what my observation is. Uh, and taking some data sets and checking it out, is that the, you, know, you really are assuming flat disks when you use those uh, parameter-free models. That, uh, and so the me theory, which asks for refractive index, a bad refractive index is better than just assuming that the particles are disks and not spheres. Uh, we also have some tools to help you get at that and some advice for how to estimate measure or estimate those properties. So, there you go. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I think the next question is for you too. Um, does your analyzer do various sieve sizes for gypsum or coal fineness? Yes, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, well, I, I guess the short answer is yes, and the long answer is yes. Yeah, we can, we can do that. I, I, I mean, I, when you get up to, say 20 millimeter sieves, then we'll have to have a conversation, but, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's you. something we face a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's a good transition. Um, the next question, Una, how 
um, staining cells affect Raman spectra? Ah, uh, it depends on the stain. Um, Raman spectroscopy does not require staining. So if you don't have to do the staining, you don't have to do the staining. Uh, but if you must, it depends on what kind of staining you are using, what kind of dyes you are using. So um, the so because the depending on the dye and laser combination, you may get fluorescence. But that's why um, Raman microscope tends to come with more than one laser so that you can avoid the fluorescence by changing to different laser. Thank you. So going back to you, this is this question refers back to your, your slide. How much time did it take for the chemical mapping for the vitamin tablet? Oh, I do not know. It is uh, data from my colleagues, so I do not know, but it it uh, the tablets like that, typical tablets like that, um, it could take as short as five to 10 minutes. So um, the data I know by heart is Excedrin tablet, um, and it's about one centimeter in diameter, and it can take, it takes less than 10 minutes. Perfect, yeah. and I think now is a good okay. time. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I'm just going to add, Una, I think your times just went down with the Soleil, but maybe that's an offline discussion. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I know you've mem memorized all the parameters on the other platforms. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, the numbers might get better. Talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can email us at labinfo at hariba.com for offline <laughs> conversations. So I'm yeah. going to send that over to you in the chat box um, so that you have it readily available. Um, it'll be sent to you too in the follow-up email. The next question is, could you elaborate on how Raman microscopy can be used in the cosmetic industry besides for particle size? Ah, so um, <clears throat> again, I mean, I'm a lab geek, so I tend to uh, rely on what I have uh, first-hand experiences, which is skin analysis. Mm -hmm. So we have had projects where you would have um, cosmetic product um, spread onto skin and um, measure, the, uh, measure the moisture over time to monitor the absorption. And as you can see, we can do the, like, you know, um, the, like particles in sunscreens and things like that. But I think that's, that was one of the uh, major applications that we worked with the cosmetic industry using ramen. Thank you. Um, do you recommend using light micros microscopy to look for agglomerates prior to LA960 analysis, 960 laser diffraction analysis? Is there a limitation with either organic or inorganic solvent systems? I think okay. this is for uh, both. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I guess uh, let's start with the first. Um, so uh, as I kind of alluded to, but I, I'm I'm a fan of multiple character characterization techniques, and and so uh, our applications lab, well, we have uh, optical microscopes that we use. Uh, to confirm laser diffraction results, for example, or for very large, for larger particle analyses. And we also have an online uh, particle imaging option for the LA960 if you want to combine both in the same tool. Uh, so that's the yes, do them both, that's great answer. The second is if you're getting into routine quality uh, control and some of the examples I showed where you can say, hey, those polylactide particles uh, at 50 microns, you could see them with an optical microscope. Uh, you're not going to get this. You you uh, you might decide to skip the optical microscopy so you can get the speed of the laser diffraction. So jump straight to laser diffraction. So if you have no clue what's happening in your system, optical microscopy is generally available and fairly inexpensive to get an idea of roughly where you're at, and that helps us if you're specking out a new instrument. Uh, if you're down to routine analyses, you often can skip the uh, the optical microscopy. Uh, the other comment, of course, uh, given this forum uh, and pharmaceuticals, 
is you'll hear a discussion of orthogonal techniques for particle characterization. And that's kind of a single word that says, if you're doing laser diffraction, you gotta do something else. And often microscopy is the, is the candidate. Uh, yeah, the second is limitations on solvents. When you spec out your analyzer, uh, we, we have kind of two broad categories. One is for use with aqueous systems and the second with non-aqueous. And, and so you'll, you'll want to know in advance that you're going to be using organic liquids uh, so that whatever, your analyzer has parts that won't dissolve. And so that's kind of the limit, is if you've committed to an aqueous system, uh, then you really can't switch. Well, the other way around works out fine. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So I'll jump back to Una. Um, with a confocal Raman microscope, can you assess particle volume? I, I have to say not really because <clears throat> the you can use Rama image, you can use optical microscopy. Both tend to be more uh, 2D, so the uh, XY uh, plane projection of the volume. So if even if you have a circle, what you see is usually the, uh, the if you, even if you have a sphere, you, what you see is usually the circle that is a projection of a sphere onto the flat surface. When you do the Raman, um, even though the fo we know focus, so the focus is changing, so we know have information of a topography, but still when you talk about the size, you may know the topography, but it's, I don't think it's if sufficient to accurately estimate the volume. So I want to say, to be conservative, I want to say um, the area, which is the uh, projection of the volume onto a flat surface. Mm. Thank you. I think you just answered another question. <laughs> uh, does particle orientation play a role in Raman chemical characterization? Ah, it depends. It depends on the particle. So let's say if you have a crystal, uh, so if you have amorphous particle, Mm -hmm. I mean, there is anything that's completely, but if you have a completely amorphous particle, it wouldn't. If you do have a crystalline particle, it will depend on crystallinity, uh, crystal phase, and, and then orientations as well. So um, it depends on the sample. It depends on samples, crystallinity, and structure. Thank you. Um, what is the resolution of Raman mapping? Can I detect trace elements? The spatial resolution of Raman microscope is diffraction limited. So um, if you want to measure the size, the 500 nanometer, about half micron, or a little bit smaller. But if you think about trace, element so low concentration in your mixed in your uh, uh, sample right if you happen to hit the particle that is impurity even so when you compare to the bulk of the sample it is a very low concentration but if raman happens to hit that particle it's raman sees the particle and particle alone so it becomes a statistical question where how many particles do I have to take uh, take spectra of to hit this uh, trace element, which is, uh, depends on the concentration. So for example, if you have, I mean, trace is, is not 10%, but let's say you have a 10%, ing uh, one ingredient is 10%. You need to hit 10 particles, statistically speaking, before you can start hoping to hit that 10% particle and so on and so forth. Thank you. This question goes back to Jeff. Um, Jeff, what is the sensitivity of the instrument for particle size distribution measurements? Is the technology applicable to at line, online, or remote testing? Okay, so uh, it, yeah, it's certainly, uh, so the LN96 that I talked about it, uh, can be used at line. Um, and we do offer an online image analysis system. 
And, and so it's going to come down to your particular application. And then the first half of your question about sensitivity, uh, that's going, well, problem is it depends. And, and, and so, uh, and it's going to depend on your particles, what size they are and how well they scatter. And so I think I'll leave it there. If you want to get back to us with a specific system, or uh, then we can start trying to get it at, at how better to answer your question. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I have shown examples where we find very small amounts of, of, of larger particles, and, and I know that that can go into fractions of a percent quite readily. Uh, so. You know, if you kind of fit in that case, we're doing great. If you have something that scatters weakly and you have a very low particle concentration, which is often how people ask about sensitivity, you'll probably look at something different than laser diffraction, maybe not a particle tracking analysis. So hope that helps. Thanks, Jeff. Una, this is a, a question from our current user. Can the Raman mapping of particle chemical identity be implemented in the old Raman, uh, Hariba Raman microscope with a software update? Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, the, as long as you have the mapping stage, um, it, is, uh, it is just the, uh, the software, uh, it is add-on to the software. So. so maybe I should just ask another software question. Does the software for Explora Plus contain image-based PSD analysis, particle size distribution? Yes, so the um, it is based on optical, micros uh, I'm sorry, optical microscope image or RAMA image, but yes, so you can get size distribution based on uh, diameter equivalent, uh, area equivalent diameter or area itself. Thank you. So going back to the question, the person who asked about the resolution of Raman mapping, can it detect trace elements? So is it, so what he's hearing is, so essentially, is it true that Raman mapping only provides information of distribution on the surface? Yes, so um, I have to, so there are Raman technology, there are Raman technologies they can penetrate the tablet, but um, so it's called the uh, transmission Raman. And there are Raman technologies where you can address large area, smaller area, AFM, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. But when you are dealing with Raman microscope coupled with optical microscopy, it is mainly for surface analysis. So surface being your sample uh, presentation, right? So if you have a tablet um, as is, you would get the top surface, or if you do the cross section, you will get the uh, information from the section, the surface. Thank you. What is the typical time for Raman analysis? Does it depend on its size or field of use? Your, it depends on the material. So um, the reason I say is, um, if you have some, so silicon is a silicon crystal is one of the strongest Raman scatter, and you can get a spectrum with a very good signal to noise ratio within milliseconds, or even shorter. If uh, or APIs, um, acetaminophen, aspirin, those small molecular APIs, they tend to have aromatic groups, which is a very good Raman scattering. Um, the having the benzene ring helps we uh, tends to have a very good Raman scattering strength. <clears throat> then you, your spectrum can be again milliseconds, five milliseconds, or you know uh, per spectrum. If you have a cellulose, which is alipatic chain, and they tend to have a low Raman scattering, and you you may need one second or so to get good signal to noise ratio. So um, number of particles obviously number of particles in the field of view number of a field of view uh, also matter but the in the end what is your material and what is is ram what is called raman scattering cross section so individual material has uh, the it is the uh, the uh, bottom line it is the it has the final say 
Thank you, Una. So this is more, the last question that I see here is more of a general question for both um, my speakers. So what are some limitations in terms of moisture content and what's, what are the lower and upper particle size that we can measure? Jeff, you wanna take it first? Sure, uh, yeah, okay, so I guess, uh, so we can do liquid suspensions and, 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 and some moisture content is obviously not a concern there. Um, so now if you're trying to measure uh, dry powders and the powders contain a lot of moisture, they tend to get sticky and that makes uh, separating them for proper analysis challenging. Uh, we do have air dispersion, which helps an awful lot with that. But if they, if they cake on the feeder and don't make it into the analyzer, we're kind of stuck. So that does, that's one limit on, on moisture. If you're in a case like that, you'll probably go ahead and finish the job, put it in water and measure, because it's clearly gonna wet if it has that much moisture in it, and, and measure as a liquid suspension. Uh, lower and upper limits for laser diffraction, we're talking tens of nanometers to several millimeters. Uh, we do offer analyzers that go from sub one nanometer uh, in dynamic light scattering up to uh, many millimeters uh, with uh, image analysis. And so I, I, to keep the focus, I only talk about one technique, but we do, uh, you can cover a wide size range as you change analyzers. So for Rama, moisture contents uh, is not a problem and you can actually take advantage of it. So uh, water peaks in Rama is all the way, um, water peaks Rama doesn't, uh, don't mix with other peaks. It's all the way uh, up to 35, 36, 100 wave numbers. So it doesn't mix with other peaks. So even if you, so solutions, echo solutions, uh, the wet samples, uh, the so on and so forth, not a problem to get a Raman spectrum. Actually, um, I think I, I mentioned about cosmetic application where, because the Raman uh, water spectrum is all the way out and kind of alone on their self, and it's, it's actually very pretty strong. So you can monitor your main ingredients in what we call fingerprint region and moisture contents by looking at the water bands all the way out so that you can monitor the water contents, whether the sample is drying, if the cream is drying and things like that. So water contents is not a problem for the ramen. Um, about the size, <clears throat> to measure the size, it is diffraction limited. And so the optical microscope, um, let's say if you think about the green laser, uh, green over 500 nanometer, you are looking at uh, about half microns or more or less. Um, here is the one, uh, I'm not sure it's an exception, but here is one point I'd like to make. The smallest particle you can get a Raman spectrum from can be even smaller than that because even if your laser is, so let's say your laser is half a micron uh, based on diffraction limit, and your uh, sample is nano, so we can uh, say nano carbon nanotubes, as long as you can find it, which is not trivial, as long as you can find it, you can get a spectrum if the uh, target is strong enough Raman scatterer. And that's why a lot of carbon nanotube studies, obviously nano uh, scales, are done with Raman. So um, for size, diffraction limited, for the smallest target, um, it depends on the sample. Thank you. So I want to honor your time, but one more question that came in. Is it okay if I ask that, Jeff, before we wrap up? Absolutely, although I have a question for Una, so I'll throw that in after yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so can LA960 laser diffraction particle size analyzer output scattering intensity versus scattering angle so their user can use their own model to fit the data? Uh, so, yeah, so that, that to give you enough information to do that, we have to reveal some design, uh, some proprietary design details about the analyzer. Uh, so we, we have to 
kind of structure some sort of non-disclosure if uh, around that that route. Uh, so, okay. And now, I guess Una, I want to ask you if uh, going back to the size range, do we have particle finder on the nano ramen systems? Is that even a consideration? The AFM ramen. Ah. Because that would get uh, you down to part, so really part small. Of, <laughs> uh, the uh, analytical part of the particle finder can go uh -huh. on to AFM RAM, uh, nano ram and no problem. Okay. Because um, the hardware part of the particle finder is uh, driving the stage, you know, yeah. going to where the particles are. Mm -hmm. So that part, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I take it back. The answer is yes. <laughs> the okay. answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> That, yeah, so that gets you a route to smaller sizes. Yes. Because you yes. use the AFM. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, thanks. Fantastic. This is this is a great example of, of complementary techniques, and it's a great yes. synergy. This is what you can expect when you do submit samples or evaluate different instruments here within Hariba. So thank you so much, Una and Jeff, for your time. And for now, have a great day. And we'll see you at our next webinar our, on March 16th from Professor Zen Yuk from University of California, where she'll discuss electrochemical energy conversion. Don't miss it. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.